In this video, we'll learn about peak rectifier circuits. A simple peak rectifier circuit is shown here. It's simply a half wave rectifier augmented with the capacitor C. One way to think about the benefit of adding C is that it's simply a filter that smooths out the very ripply waveform that shows up at the output of a half wave rectifier and smooths out the dips that arise between positive half cycles, resulting in a more constant DC output. This is useful in cases where, for example, you're trying to use the rectifier to generate a DC supply voltage. A more uh, nuanced interpretation of how the circuit works can be obtained again by thinking about it in its two operating conditions. First, let's think about what happens when the diode D is forward biased. So in this case, let's just use the ideal diode model to keep things simple. We're simply neglecting the 0.7 volt forward drop on the diode, which may be negligible if the voltages involved are relatively large, but even if they need to be included, they can be included straightforwardly later. The intuition remains the same. So with an ideal diode model, when D1 is forward biased, we can replace it with a short circuit. So in this circumstance, we'll see that the diode is conducting a forward current that, according to a nodal equation, will flow to two places. It'll be the sum of the current being used to charge up the capacitor C and the current delivered to the load resistor R. This is an important difference between the peak rectifier and the simple half wave rectifier. The forward current the diode has to handle is larger than in the simple half wave rectifier where it only had to deliver uh, current to the load resistor R. Now it's also got to deliver the additional current to charge up capacitor C. Now let's consider what happens when the diode is reverse biased that may arise when the voltages VI are small or negative even. In such cases, using an di ideal diode model, we would simply replace D1 with an open circuit. Now no current can flow through the diode. Now in the case of the simple half-wave rectifier, no current through the diode meant no current through the load, but that's no longer the case here. Now, even when the diode is off, current can continue to flow from capacitor C through to the load resistor R. So during this period of time, the capacitor is being discharged and the output voltage will decline, but it won't immediately drop to zero as it did in the simple half-wave rectifier. In fact, if we make the capacitor value C large enough, the capacitor can continue to deliver charge to the load until the next time the diode D1 becomes forward biased, and then it gets replenished, all the charge it's lost, and uh, when this is working properly, essentially there's a nearly constant current flowing through the resistor R, periodically coming from the source VI, but the rest of the time just coming from the capacitor C. It sort of acts like a reservoir of charge in between the peaks of the waveform VI. Typical waveforms look like this. Again, remember we're using an ideal diode model in this case, so there's no forward voltage drop across the diode included in these waveforms. That makes everything line up nicely. So assuming the input VI is coming from a transformer subject to a sinusoidal voltage, then VI is this sinusoid shown here, and we see that on positive half cycles, the output voltage follows the input voltage VI, the output voltage plotted in blue then equals VI at the peak with no forward voltage drop modeled here again. And thereafter, as soon as VI dips down below its peak, the capacitor voltage, the capacitor maintains the voltage at the output VO for a while longer. And immediately, therefore, 
we see that a reverse voltage is developed across D equal to VO on the right and VI on the left. So this reverse voltage means that the diode is off throughout this entire window. That was case two on our last slide. During this period of time, as we mentioned, the capacitor C delivers, continues to deliver current to load resistor R. In doing so, its voltage drops slowly because we've chosen C to be very, very large. Now we know if we were to extend this plot out indefinitely, what we would have is a simple RC circuit. And so we would see exponential decay of the voltage asymptotically approaching zero at the output VO. But what happens is long before this exponential decay drops very low, the next positive half cycle of VI arrives. As soon as VI, the black waveform here, exceeds the instantaneous value at the output VO, then the diode D becomes forward biased again, and it immediately turns on. Again, I'll just remind you that we're neglecting the 0.7 volt drop using an ideal diode model for now. If we included it, the blue waveform would be shifted down by 0.7 volts. In any case, at this point in time, the diode turns on again and it begins conducting until the peak of the um, positive half cycle of the sinusoid. So during this narrow window of time, which is referred to as the conduction interval, that corresponds to case two on our last slide, where D2 is on. In this relatively narrow conduction interval, and it's got to be narrow if we want the supply volt, the output voltage, VO, to remain relatively constant. So during this relatively narrow conduction interval, the source through the diode has to completely replenish all the charge that's lost during the rest of the sinusoidal cycle. So the picture in terms of the current waveforms look like this, it looks like this on the bottom here. The current delivered to the load IL is plotted here in blue. It's simply equal to VO divided by the load resistor R. So it has the exact same shape. It's therefore relatively constant with a little bit of ripple, which we'll want to quantify later. Um, so that current flows constantly. During phase two, that current is all coming from the capacitor C because the diode's off. And during uh, phase one here, I should have labeled this phase one. Let me just fix that. The um, currents being replenished through the diode. So the diode current actually arises only in this narrow conduction interval and is uh, results in a very large spike of current through the diode. Now, if you integrate the area under a current waveform versus time, then you end up with the total amount of charge that's conducted during that time interval. So what you see is that when the diode's off, all the current through the load resistor is coming from the capacitor C, so that's all the charge that's lost each cycle. And once we're in steady state, the waveforms aren't changing from one cycle to the next, then that must mean that the current supplied during this narrow conduction interval must exactly equal the current, the charge that's lost during the rest of the cycle, which means the area of these two shaded regions have to be the same. This shaded region here uh, represents the difference between the diode current and the load current. So that therefore, you know, remembering that capacitor current IC is equal to the diode current minus the load current. So that's a positive charge flowing onto the capacitor, replenishing all the charge that's lost um, over here. Here, during this portion of the waveform, the capacitor current is negative because all of the load current is coming from it. Now, if we're gonna use the 
output of his peak rectifier circuit as a DC supply voltage, we're probably quite interested in the amount of ripple on it. Ideally, we'd like the ripple to be very, very small so that the output looks like a perfectly constant DC voltage. Um, so we're going to make a couple of assumptions to simplify the analysis here that basically boil down to um, the assumption that the ripple is relatively small. So when the ripple is relatively small, we assume that the output voltage is near the peak of the sinusoid VP uh, at all points in time. Therefore, the load current remains constant at around VP over R, pretty much throughout the sinusoid. Now, outside the conduction interval, that's all coming from the capacitor. So I see equals negative load current, so negative VP over R. Now, we know that the voltage is the integral, the voltage on a capacitor is the integral of the current uh, flowing into it. And so, therefore, the current is the derivative of the voltage across it. So we can find the slope of this voltage waveform VO, which is equal to the voltage on the capacitor, by simply taking the current negative VP over R and dividing it by the capacitance. Larger capacitance will mean that the voltage drops more slowly for the same current. So taking that into account, and assuming that the conduction interval is very, very small, which would certainly be the case if um, there's very little ripple, then we can say that the amount of droop or ripple VR can be approximately calculated by considering that that slope VP over RC persists over one entire period T. So you end up with this expression shown here for the ripple on the output VO. Again, it's approximate, but it will be relatively accurate, assuming that the conduction interval is very, very short, and also uh, assuming that we can neglect the forward voltage drop of 0.7 volts. If we wanted to include that, there's simply a mi minus 0 0.7 volts uh, to be included there. Another thing we may be interested in is finding the precise value of the conduction interval delta t. We've assumed that it's small in the preceding calculations, but it's obviously non-zero. Uh, and we're interested in it because that essentially captures the fraction of time for which the diode is actually on. And this can play a role in um, calculating how much power dissipation and heating the diode needs to be able to handle. So um, we can find that now uh, because we know, using the preceding calculation approximately, uh, how low VO is at the onset of conduction. So we simply have to solve for the uh, angle of the cosine waveform here that results in um, the waveform equaling V peak minus VR. So specifically, we can solve for the point when Vp t uh, times cos of omega delta t, where omega is um, 2 pi over the period capital T. We solve for when that's exactly equal to this voltage level, Vp minus Vr. And again, there's some approximation involved here, especially in our, um, in particular, in our calculation of Vr. We can come up with a tidy closed form expression for the conduction interval delta t by making the further approximation shown here, where essentially we take only um, the first term uh, in the Taylor series expansion of the cosine. And again, that's going to be valid for 
small delta t in particular for omega delta t much less than one then that'll um, substituting that into the expression above and rearranging gives rise to this expression for the conduction interval This is also often expressed uh, instead of in units of seconds, instead of maybe expressed in degrees as an angle by um, multiplying it by omega. This product omega times delta t is therefore often referred to as the conduction angle. which again, you know, given, given in the conduction angle in degrees, we can divide that by 360 degrees, regardless of the period of the oscillation. And we can figure out what fraction of time the diode is conducting. Another property of the peak rectifier circuit we may be interested in is finding the maximum current instantaneously required to be conducted by the diode D. This is an important specification of diodes. Exceeding its maximum rated current can result in overheating and permanent damage to the diode. So if we're designing one of these circuits, we want to make sure we choose a suitable diode that can handle, actually handle the peak current. So when would the peak forward current arise? It would arise at this point in time here, because we remember that just looking at the nodal equation here, ID equals IC plus IL. IL is pretty constant at around Vp over R. And uh, but the capacitor current varies. It's dependent on the slope of the capacitor voltage, which is Vo, over time. And uh, it's going to equal the slope of that waveform times the capacitor value C. So clearly, during the conduction interval, the maximum slope on the capacitor value C arises right here at the onset of conduction. So having found the conduction interval delta T, we can substitute in uh, we, we know that the waveform during this window of time and its value here is um, vp times cos omega delta t and we can find the slope of the waveform evaluated right there substitute end, into this expression and then find the maximum diode current at time t1. And if you do that, you get an expression uh, like the one shown here. You'll see over here, you've got the load current, IL. The unity term in brackets corresponds to the relatively constant current, IL, equal to Vp over R. So that corresponds to the second term up above. and then the uh, second bracketed term down here times IL, that comes from the uh, derivative of the capacitor voltage over time. So clearly there's some approximations made in this analysis, but it does uh, give you uh, a rough calculation of the maximum current the diode has to be able to handle. And typically, you know, you would apply some extra margin on top of that and select the diode that could handle um, significantly more current than that just in case of any uh, funny business <laughs> or a strange transient waveform that might show up. Now a challenge of the half wave peak rectifier circuit is that um, the capacitor has to provide all the charge required by the load during one entire period of the sinusoid. Uh, 
Instead, you can probably imagine making a full wave peak rectifier circuit, taking, for example, a bridge rectifier like the one shown here, and just adding a capacitor across the load R and choosing that capacitor value large enough so that the output voltage VO is held relatively constant when um, in between uh, half cycles of the sinusoidal VS. So here you'll notice that the capacitor only has to supply charge to the load during half of the sinusoidal period, T over two. So this can allow you to, for example, choose a capacitor value half the size and have the same ripple or to cut the ripple in half. Um, it can also help reduce the uh, peak current that need to be handled by the diodes because now um, the, uh, you only need to replenish the amount of charge over half a cycle during the conduction interval instead of the charge lost over a full cycle of the sinusoid. So calculations for the impact of all that on um, the peak currents that flow, the conduction intervals, and so on, can be found in the text. Peak rectifiers can also be used for a different application. So shown here is an amplitude modulated waveform. Such waveforms are often uh, used in communication, for example, AM radio, looks simply like this, where the audio signal is um, imparted on a high frequency sinusoid uh, by modulating its amplitude or changing its amplitude uh, over time. So for example, the peak or envelope of the sinusoid varies over time. And um, it's really that waveform VP shown with solid black line here that has the information that's trying to be communicated. The frequency of the underlying sinusoid labeled omega naught here is simply a carrier that carries the message VP on its amplitude. So a peak rectifier can be used then to recover the peak waveform VP from the carrier, the amplitude modulated carrier signal. Um, but to do the, the requirements on a, on a rectifier circuit to do this are a little different than those we've talked about so far. First of all, you actually want the peak detector uh, output to dip in response to changes in the carrier envelope. So this may impact your choice of the capacitor value C to ensure that it actually discharges fast enough to capture all of these uh, dips in VP. On the other hand, it will continue to discharge even when the envelope's increasing. So choosing C too small will result in uh, large dips at the output of the peak rectifier that are not representative of real changes in the information bearing envelope signal, VP. Um, for this reason, usually the envelope signal VP would have to be changing relatively slowly compared to the underlying carrier frequency, omega naught. So um, that's one difference uh, in a rectifier circuit that you use for an application like this. Another is that often the waveform itself might have relatively small amplitude overall, uh, unlike the signals coming from AC line voltage where you may have a very large voltages involved. Here, the 0.7 volt forward drop of the diode is likely to be very significant. So this might necessitate a totally different type of a rectifier circuit that is not subject to the 0.7 volt forward drop. Here's an example of such a circuit that may be called a precision rectifier. It makes use of an op amp in this case to um, absorb or provide, if you like, the 0.7 volt forward drop required by the diode. So again, we can think about what happens when in two cases where the diode's forward conducting and when it's not. So when the diode's on, then um, using our 0.7 volt constant forward voltage drop model here, which we need to do because again, we're interested in a situation where the amplitudes involved are not very large. 
So we're going to replace the diode with our constant 0.7 volt here. Um, and we see in this case that VO is precisely equal to VI thanks to the virtual short circuit that arises at the op amp inputs. The output of the op amp itself, which we can label VA, must therefore be equal to VI plus 0 0.7 volts. So again, we're relying on the op amp, if you like, to provide that extra 0 0.7 volts to forward bias the diode. But, you know, an ideal op amp, op amp or even a practical op amp with sufficient supply voltages can certainly do that without problem. The other case we're interested in is when the diode's off. So this would be the case for negative voltages at VI. So in this case, we can replace the diode with an open circuit. Now in this case, remember that our ideal op amp has zero current into its input terminals, and there's certainly no current flowing to the reverse bias diode, seeing as it's replaced with an open circuit here. So therefore, a uh, simple nodal equation at the output node reveals there can be no current flowing through the resistor, and as a result, no voltage drop across it. So when will we be in each of these um, two situations? Well, in order to be in the top situation, again, there's no current flowing into the op amp, so there needs to be forward current flowing this way through the diode reverse current can't flow through a diode that's on. So that will only be the case, we'll only get current flowing through the resistor with the polarity shown there if VO is greater than zero. And since VO equals VI, that means we're only gonna be in case one when VI is greater than zero. The rest of the time, the diode will be off and we'll end up in case two. So in summary, the operation of the precision rectifier here can be thought of in two cases. The first is when the diode's on, and here we've got the output equal to VI, and the second, when the diode's off, and in this case, VO is equal precisely zero. And we did the analysis here, even including the forward voltage drop of the diode when it's on but that forward voltage drop was provided by the op amp, so it doesn't arise at the output. This part, this rectifier characteristic goes all the way down to VI equals zero. So even with a VI of 10 millivolts, you should see a VO of 10 millivolts at the output. Again, assuming a, an ideal op amp here. So this is like a precision rectifier circuit, and we can then turn this into a peak rectifier by again adding a capacitor across it. A circuit like this with appropriately chosen values of R and C can do things like demodulate the amplitude modulated AM waveform that we showed earlier.